You're watching EASD TV. Now, I always think that the prize lectures are the jewels in the EASD crown. And of course, you can watch them all online in the seclusion and comfort of your own home at a time that suits you. Now, I'm delighted that we've got another of the prize award givers here with us, and that's Gerald Shulman, who's giving the ESD Lily Centennial Anniversary Prize Award. And your lecture is about insulin resistance. Uh, you are, and I have to look at this to make sure that I get it absolutely right, the George C. Cowgill Professor of Cellular and Molecular Physiology uh, at Yale. That's correct, yes. Few. <laughs> American titles are very, very long. So what made you interested in insulin resistance? So during medical school, I was always interested in metabolism and I was interested in uh, diabetes. I realized what an important health problem this was. Uh, and I realized insulin resistance was a major factor in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Um, so after medical school, you do your residency and then fellowship. And so during my fellowship, I wanted to understand the process, what was actually causing insulin resistance. And so uh, we, I got interested in this method uh, called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. It allows one to non-invasively assess metabolic flux um, inside. Uh, the cell. We could do this in humans. It's non-invasive. There's no ionizing radiation. And um, we can measure, for example, the, the rate of glycogen synthesis uh, in human muscle using an infusion of uh, 1C13 glucose. Uh, using this process, we're able to uh, determine that it was insulin-stimulated muscle glycogen synthesis that was the major reason for muscle insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. And what did that open up? So that was the first question. So now this says, okay, this is the process. It's not oxidation, not glycolysis. Then it opened up a new series of questions. What's the rate controlling step in this process? And so at that time, you know, we, you learn in the, the metabolic pathways, glucose gets into the cell, it's phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate. It goes through a couple steps. And then the enzyme glycogen synthase takes UDP glucose to glycogen. There were three steps that had all been implicated to be defective and causing muscle insulin resistance. The uh, glycogen synthase, that enzyme, the enzyme hexokinase, and then the glucose transporter. This needs to be translocated to move glucose from outside to inside the cell. Um, so we next then applied a novel phosphorus NMR technique, again, non-invasive, no ionizing radi radiation, to measure glucose 6-phosphate in skeletal muscle arguing that if the block is at synthase, glucose 6-phosphate should increase. The block is at transport or hexokinase phosphorylation, G6P should not change or go down. And what we found under the same kind of conditions of insulin-stimulated uh, muscle glycogen synthesis, the block G6P did not change. It was lower than in the controls, and that implicated transport phosphorylation. So then the next question becomes, is it transport or phosphorylation? So we developed a novel carbon NMR method to measure intracellular glucose for the first time in humans. Again, arguing if the block is at, at transport, glucose should stay low. If it's at hexokinase, uh, the glucose should be higher in the diabetic muscle. And what we found is glucose was lower in the type 2 uh, uh, individuals um, and with insulin um, resistance. Were these so, results so, that you were expecting? Well, or? it was, you know, again, you go into um, uh, a study uh, asking the question, which one is it? Try to you have an open mind. I think we suspected it might be transport. But again, there was a lot of debate in the field. A lot of people were saying that it was hexokinase. And we found glucose did not change, implicating transport as the rate controlling step. So you'd settled that question, so but we then settled, what? <laughs> so we settled that question, and that is why why is this important? Well, you need to understand if you want to come up with new therapies, the best therapies to treat insulin resistance in muscle. You want to know which one of those steps is responsible. And so this this first set of studies implicated transport. This is the rate controlling step. This is the pharmacologic target that you go after if you want to fix muscle insulin resistance. And so how long a period had this kind of journey of discovery taken? So this, these set of studies were probably over uh, uh, 
several years and then led us to the next set of questions. So what's wrong with the transporter? And so this then led us into the world of lipids. So we had known for a long time the relationship between obesity and insulin resistance. And we asked the question, maybe it's not so much how much fat you have, it's really the fat, where the fat is located. If the fat is intracellularly, uh, located inside the muscle cell, maybe that's what's triggering it. So then we developed another uh, uh, NMR method, proton NMR method, to actually measure fat inside the muscle cell. And using this approach, we found that it was fat inside the muscle cell that was the best predictor of insulin resistance in virtually every population we looked at. We did this in young people, did this in the elderly, we did this in children. In sedentary individuals, it's the fat inside the muscle cell that is the best correlate, the best predictor of muscle insulin resistance. And so now to the next level of questions, how does fat cause insulin resistance? I bet you were a really annoying kid. <laughs> Constantly saying, why, but why, but why? You want it, well, you want it, again, understanding the mechanism will then lead to the best way to then treat the problem. And so we then uh, showed that a lipid infusion in healthy individuals raising fatty acids induced the same defect in insulin-stimulated glucose transport, and we went on to hypothesize it induced a defect in insulin signaling, and using actually biopsy studies now in humans, we showed that raising fatty acids induced a defect in insulin-stimulated PI3 kinase. This is a required step for insulin-induced GLUT4 translocation. And so, so now, now we, now we, now we actually understand. Then it's the lipid, uh, lipid moiety, fatty acid moiety that triggers this defect in insulin signaling and action. So it's a hell of a journey of discovery, <laughs> if I may say Thank you. so. Thank you. It really yeah. is, and and actually, you've have to come up with all the novel methodologies in order to pursue your yeah. the answer to your yeah. next question. But these questions you discovered yeah. are not just something that is pertinent to type 2 diabetes. It has much wider implications. Yes, so insulin resistance, again, is probably the most uh, uh, important predictor uh, and I, I think responsible for developing type 2 diabetes. We know this because if we prevent insulin resistance or reverse insulin resistance, we can actually reverse type 2 diabetes. Beta cell dysfunction, of course, is critical for the progression from insulin resistance to fast and hyperglycemia. But if we can understand insulin resistance, we'll fix diabetes. But besides, it goes insulin resistance goes well beyond uh, type 2 diabetes. It's cardiovascular disease. I think we have evidence that young insulin resistant individuals are prone to atherogenic dyslipidemia, high triglycerides, low HDL. Uh, we've shown that it makes people prone to fatty liver disease. This is now the most common liver disease on the planet, metabolic associated fatty liver disease. Uh, insulin resistance was probably driving obesity associated cancers, which are now increasing exponentially in this country and around the, uh, in Europe and, and the U.S. and around the world. And even Alzheimer's has been related to insulin resistance. So if we can crack this puzzle of insulin Ooh, resistance, find a, a new therapy, there. Sorry about that. <laughs> we can, uh, I think, do a lot of good in terms of making people healthier. So you've spent a lifetime yeah. in insulin resistance. Yeah. Are there still questions to be answered? So, well, the, the, the next level of questions which we didn't get into is actually the molecular basis. So, so I've shown lipid is driving this defect in insulin signaling. So what is that lipid moiety? And so we've um, now I, I've identified the fatty acid moiety. It's diacylglycerol. It's the penultimate step in triglyceride synthesis. It's a bioactive uh, molecule. It activates a series of novel protein kinase Cs that lead to the actual defect in insulin signaling. So this is the process required for both stimulating glucose uptake in muscle, turning off hepatic glucose production, stimulating glucose uptake in the fat cell and other processes. And we, in the most recent set of studies, we've actually identified the amino acid on the insulin receptor, this is the threonine 1160, that protein kinase C phosphorylates and inhibits the receptor kinase. And uh, this is quite interesting to me, at least, because 
it's in the catalytic domain of the insulin receptor, and uh, it's conserved from humans to fruit flies. This amino so, acid, the, again, this, so critically important. Anything that's conserved in, through, all through, through evolution those. that ha that always tells us something. Probably yes. it's been. It's doing a something really important. fundamental so process. You have to step back and say, why insulin resistance? Why why would insulin resistance be important, be to, a fruit important fly. to evolution and fruit fly? And it turns out this pathway that I've described, where during um, uh, uh, the lipid builds up in the cell, activates this novel protein kinase, phosphorylates the receptor, inhibits the receptor, why would that be important uh, throughout evolution? And as it turns out, this gets activated during starvation. So. Ah. During starvation, ah. you want to become insulin resistant because, guess what? You need to keep glucose in the bloodstream to keep the brain going. This is a critical substrate for the CNS and other obligatory glucose utilizers. So during evolution, you, you've evolved this pathway. We've shown it occurs. This DAG, PKC, insulin receptor kinase pathway happens in muscle, happens in liver, happens in the fat cell, happens in brown adipocytes. Most recently, we've shown it's in the kidney and it gets activated during starvation. And that's, that's a perfectly good process in terms of promoting survival. And in our current environment, overnutrition leads to activation of this pathway and insulin resistance and metabolic disease. It's fascinating. It's really fascinating. And the four horsemen of the apocalypse, yes. you know, famine, war, yes. but there's also one, there's disease. Yes. And when when you have uh, f famine, your brain is supplied with glucose, but everything else gets switched off. You know, that's, to that's correct. Yes, your reproduction, your immune that's system. Right. That's right. So we become, you know, our brain survives, but then we all get some horrible infection and die. Right. I mean, that's well, that eventually. I mean, but but again, sorry, uh, we're being but, apocalyptic here. <laughs> but the 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 you know this whole starvation response uh, again, this is um, is is to promote survival and insulin resistance promotes survival by keeping the brain supplied with energy. And so uh, uh, and this is what all animals have had to had had to deal with during 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 the course of evolution. Evolution, if you it's, follow me. Yeah. It's a wonderful yeah, yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's a wonderful story that you can hear if you uh, tune in to the Minkowski Lecture. I'm sorry, Minkowski Lecture. We tune into the uh, Lily. Sorry, too many lecture, private lectures we're doing today. The Li Eli Lilly Centennial Award. So there we go. Gerald Shulman, thank you so much. It's been thank such you. a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure. There's more to come.